So I wanted to say what we're going to do today. It's going to be a little bit different than what you guys are probably used to, but that's okay. Just like last week. But up here on the front row, I have most of our students that will be going on the spring retreat, which is not next Sunday, but the Sunday after. And for those that might not know, uh, our students' ministry includes both middle school and high school, so 6th through 12th grade. And over the last three years, we've been able to take them on a student retreat, raised by fundraising, things like that. The first year, we went up to Nebraska City, Nebraska, and we saw Arbor Day Farms. We rented out a bed and breakfast, and I did the lessons myself up there. Uh, and we just had a lot of fun. And the last two years, last year and upcoming, the first Sunday of March, uh, we will be going down to Silver Dollar City for what they call Young Christians Weekend. And so, yes, it is an amusement park, but they bring in bands, they bring in uh, guest speakers that come specifically to talk to the students about uh, the Christian faith, about walking with Jesus, uh, things like that. And so we did that last year. The students were like, it was just wonderful. We didn't have to listen to you do all the lessons. So uh, we're going to do it again this year. And so this morning, they are going to help me out in our message for the day. They are going to be our scripture readers because we are going to read all, basically, Mark 14. And there's about 70-some verses in Mark 14. And so we have it divided up, and I'm going to be talking a little bit in between each reader, giving a little bit of a synopsis or a lesson or something like that. But uh, I just wanted to let you know what we're going to be doing here. So, so we know where we are in Mark chapter 14. We are in the middle of Holy Week. Palm Sunday has already passed. Jesus is now on Wednesday evening is where we're going to pick up. So Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Easter. We get to the Wednesday and that's where we're going to pick up is that evening when Jesus is resting with his disciples in the house of a person named Simon. Uh, he's resting there. So a lot of things have already happened. Jesus has already cleansed the temple where he overthrew the money changing tables and things like that. And he's been teaching all of Tuesday and all of Wednesday in the temple. And we get to Wednesday evening and this is where our story begins. Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such a expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, Leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priests to arrange to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted when they heard why he had come. They promised to give him money. So he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. This woman showed great honor to Jesus, pouring that jar of alabaster on Jesus. Yet while Jesus was anointed by this woman at Simon's house, his own disciples started to fracture. This is the first time in the Gospel of Mark that we see real disagreement and we begin to see the betrayal come. Often the Gospel of Mark speaks of the disciples as not getting it or clueless. 
as to who Jesus was, but now we see evil intentions and greed seep into this relationship of the disciples and Jesus. And now our story continues. On the first day of the festival of the unleavened bread, when the Passover of the lamb sacrifice, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? So Jesus sent them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. As the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will tell you upstairs, he will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare a meal. So the two disciples went to the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. In the evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve. As they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me here will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one of them in turn asked, Am I the one? He replied, It is one of you twelve who is eating from this bowl with me, for the Son of Man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays me. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. And as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. And then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them, and they all drank it. And then he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it in the new kingdom of God. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. And so here we continue to see the disciples fracture as they begin questioning each other as to who will betray Jesus. Yet even though Jesus knew who it would be and that they were even at that table with him, Jesus still chose to eat with them. Just as Jesus continually chose to eat with the sinners, he also chose to eat with his betrayer. What a beautiful picture that is for you and for me as we too have betrayed Jesus. And now our story continues. On the way, Jesus told them, All of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter said to him, Even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter declared emphatically, Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the others vowed the same. Not only was Jesus eating with the one who would betray him, but he even tells them that they will all abandon him. Of course, Peter, in all his bur uh, bravado, says that even if someone else does, he never will. Even after Jesus specifically confronts Peter, he reiterates that he, above anyone else, will never fail Jesus. How often do we fall into that same trap of Jesus, with Jesus? So confident in our relationship that we actually ignore our blind spots. Instead of a solid oak that we think we are, often we end up being a hollowed out log. We say we will never betray Jesus, that we will never abandon him, that we will always stand for him, but often we fail. And now our story continues. They went to the olive grove called Jessamine, and Jesus said, Sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, 
My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further and fell to the ground. He prayed that, if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned and found the disciples asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them again and prayed the same prayers before. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open, and they didn't know what to say. When he returned to them the third time, he said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But know, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up. Let's get going. Look, my betrayer is here. Here we see the disciples, Peter included, failing at the little things. Jesus is just hours from a torturous death. He is nearing the end. He is pleading with God the Father to allow this time to pass. Yet Jesus in all his humanity shows his submission to God the Father. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And th through this pain and agony that their teacher was going through, the disciples simply slept, slept, and slept some more. And now our story continues. And immediately, even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I, agree, when I greet him with a kiss. Then you can take him away under guard. As soon as they arrived, Judas walked up to the Jesus. Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him the kiss. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Jesus asked them, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and gloves to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there among you teaching every day. But these things are happening to fulfill what the scriptures say about me. Then all his disciples deserted him and ran away. One young man following behind was clothed in only a long linen shirt. When the mob tried to grab him, he slipped out of his shirt and ran away naked. Jesus will never be a free man after this. He will be taken into custody and he will die there. He was betrayed by one of his closest followers, one of the twelve. Think of twelve of your closest friends. Does one of them have it in, the, in them to betray you and have you killed simply for money? Jesus did. And this happened in the middle of the night, away from the crowds and the people who were amazed by his teachings. Yet while Jesus could have used violence, he chose not to, recognizing God's will in this situation. And now our story continues. They took Jesus to the high priest's home where the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and went right into the high priest's courtyard. There he sat with the guards, warming himself by the fire. Inside, the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they couldn't find any. Many false witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. Finally, some men stood up and gave this false testimony. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. But even then, they didn't get their stories straight. Then the high priest stood up before the others and asked Jesus, Well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus was silent and made no reply. Then the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand 
and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horn and said, Why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. Then some of them began to spit at him, and they blindfolded him and beat him with the fist. Prophesied to us, they jeered, and the guards slapped him as they took him away. Jesus' death sentence is now sealed. He is found guilty because he boldly professed that he was, in fact, the long-awaited Messiah, that he was the son of the Blessed One. The Jewish leaders took this as an act of blasphemy. The Jewish leaders thought he was showing irreverence to God by saying Jesus, a man, was actually also divine. They could not accept Jesus as the Messiah. He did not live up to their ex expectations. So they spit on him, beat him, and killed him. And now our story continues. Meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and said, You were one of those with Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. Just then a rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she, being, she began telling the others, this man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again. A little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter and said, you must be one of them because you are a Galilean. Galilean. Peter swore, Peter swore a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he broke down and wept. What we begin saying at the very end of that reading is what true repentance looks like. Peter had denied Jesus. He had sinned against Jesus. And it cut him so deeply he began to weep. Couldn't believe that he would do that. When we look at our lives and we sin against God, we too should show that act of repentance where we are truly sorrowful about what we have done to God through our own actions. Now as our story left off, Jesus is still alive. When you come on Good Friday, this Friday at 7, we will kind of pick up this story and we will read through his torturous, torturous death. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this day and the blessings that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to hear your words fresh. Perhaps it's a story we've heard many times, but perhaps today we heard something new. Lord God, we ask that we, we search our hearts and our lives to see where we often have blind spots, where we often fall short, where we often fail. And we just praise you and thank you that Jesus, that perfect sacrifice, never gave in to those temptations that we give in to. In Christ we pray. Amen. You guys want to go back, you can, or stay here, whatever you do. Uh, I want to thank them for doing that. I know reading is not something that necessarily they are all that excited to do, but I thought they did a wonderful job, and so thank you guys.